Hello watch enthusiasts! Now today I'd like to speak about vintage watches which I've noticed have been particularly good value this month on the vintage market. And uh, these watches offer interesting decoration in terms of, um, of dials, as well as interesting military connections um, for really most of the watches in this, in this, uh, this video. Likewise, these watches represent a great deal in the histories of the respective brands they, they're, they're from, and are all much older pieces from the 1930s, 40s and 50s, and, uh, and, and as such offer a great deal to the collector, as well as the casual owner in terms of having, having a real piece of, of history in one's collection, without spending an enormous amount of money, albeit um, this video will address various price ranges um, from, uh, from a few hundred pounds to a few thousand pounds. However, before I begin the video, I would of course like to encourage you all to join the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snups, a social media platform where you can share pictures of your collections and interests, and, uh, and on this particular group, the Watch Guys, you can share your passion for watches with other collectors and myself, as well as ask any questions to the community, or indeed uh, ask me any video requests, which I'll be happy to, to reply to. And for today's interesting picture, we have Logan's beautiful vintage Grand Seiko, which shows all the elegance which has been carried into today's models, but with um, with that, that that classical flair of a vintage timepiece, with that wonderful black line running down the hands and the indices, and those fantastic faceted polished sides. Now the first pieces I'd like to talk about are not watches, but rather movements. And the reason for this is that I'd like to talk about watches with the Omega Caliber 30 T2. And this is a movement which became extremely well known in, uh, in the 1940s for being used in a number of Omega watches, and this is a 15 joule manually wound movement, which is relatively simple in its construction, but formed the basis for a great deal of important Omega models, both in the fields of dress watches and sports watches, with a very, very interesting military connection. And these watches are also remarkably well valued if you look for the, um, the, 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 the most interesting of pieces. And of course, these pieces do extend up into the higher price ranges for the better preserved examples with more interesting histories. But with these movements, you are able to get a gorgeous timepiece with, uh, with all the engineering of the 1940s and with all the history from that period as well. Now, the beauty of these timepieces is that whilst the vast majority of them um, in a more reasonable price range of between £400 and £900, pounds, which are the civilian versions, don't feature perhaps the heritage um, of the military examples, which I'll talk about in a bit, they do offer stainless steel cases, which are rare from brands in this period, especially available for this sort of price. Now, the cases will be on the small side at 33 or so millimetres, with some extending to 35, but the vast majority being around that 33 to 33 and a half millimetre size. However, the beauty of these cases is that they are um, very, um, uh, very large in terms of dial to body ratios. So you see a very large dial in relation to small lugs and a small crown. And what this means is they appear much larger on the wrist than they would otherwise, and so have a, a wonderful compromise between a small watch for smaller wrists and a large dial for those who like a, a more significant watch on, 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 the, on the wrist. The display of these watches generally comes in two versions. Some versions feature the small seconds placed at 6 o'clock in a very traditional sort of arrangement, whilst others feature central seconds which are, are, are hard to come by and more rare. However, there is a great variety of different styles of dials, from matted silvers um, all the way through to very nicely patinaed creams. And so it is, it is worth looking around, though of course it is worth uh, being careful for refinished dials. And though refinished dials aren't the end of the world, especially at this price range, it's for, for those who are interested, it is worth keeping an eye out, because sometimes they have been fettled with over the years. Um, and it, this does depend on how you feel about a watch. If you can get a watch for a very good price, then personally I wouldn't worry too much if you can guarantee the rest of the watch is, um, is, is all correct. However, of course, it is worth noting these things, that with all vintage watches, you do have to be careful, because sometimes um, these aspects have been tampered with. Now, a lot of them featured, uh, featured luminescent hands in the day. Now, these will no longer be luminescent um, today, um, although some, some uh, radium versions um, may well have a certain glow to them. Um, the vast majority won't have any glow left, which is by no means a problem. Whilst the script for Omega is that very simple old-fashioned style from the 1940s, which is highly charming, as well as the, um, the, the older style of Omega symbol, which, uh, which I personally find extremely attractive. If you're willing to extend into the higher price ranges, then some gold-cased versions are available for between about, about £1,000 and 1700 to £1,800. These versions often feature golden hands as well, and these can often be seen as leaf-style hands with, um, with more Art Deco styles of numerals, which in my eyes are very, very beautiful and actually constitute a very interesting timepiece to own, as well as the fact that the, uh, the gold will generally um, have, um, have less, uh, less surface uh, pitting in terms of corrosion, as a result of it being a, a far less reactive metal. 
and of course this does add a certain luster to these watches, which the stainless steel models simply won't have. However, if the civilian versions of these watches are seen as interesting, the military models are fascinating. These pieces constitute really the, the, the birth of the military field watch, and are, are a fantastic alternative, as has been pointed out in fact by uh, some members on, on, on the Snups group, as a wonderful alternative to buying a vintage Rolex Explorer, for example a 1016 reference. And these models feature, again, stainless steel cases, but they feature a few uh, different features which are worth noting before buying one, but if you can get hold of one in good condition, can be absolutely tremendous to own. Firstly, they generally feature black dials instead of the cream ones, simply for added legibility. Additionally, there are a lot of models with, uh, with far more clear indices between, um, uh, between larger uh, five-minute markers, which allow you to be able to judge the, the minutes far more accurately, as would be needed by, by someone in the armed forces. Additionally, the crowns tend to be larger, and the, and the, the lugs are elongated to provide uh, extra space for a thicker strap. Also, on many of these versions, there are fixed lug bars. Now, these can be a bit of a pain if you like to, to swap out straps quickly and easily, but you can buy straps, for example, from Collareb, which feature a fold-over set setup, where you fold the strap over around the, the fixed bar and then pin it with, with pins already mounted to the strap. Of course, this shouldn't be an issue if you're already wearing the watch on a single-piece leather or NATO strap. Now, these watches often also feature the markers um, in order to denote their military um, uh, position on the dial in, in the form of that arrow, which, uh, which shows their use by the British Armed Forces. Additionally, a lot of these watches feature that on the case back or on the inside of the case back as well, which can often be a better judge of these watches, um, because that's more difficult to, uh, to duplicate or fake. And of course, one has to be even more careful with these watches than with the civilian models, but if you can get hold of a really nice one, these should set you back between £1,400 and £3,000, which means that you're able to get a, a, an incredible piece of history for a fraction of what a Rolex Explorer from, uh, from a later period would cost. Now, the next watches I'd like to talk about are from Gégé Le Coudre, and JLC produced a number of watches through the 1940s, with, uh, with the early 1940s models during the war being primarily plated base metal. So they had a chrome finish, which by now has worn off on the vast majority of these watches, and dark dials. And the dark dials were there really because these were used by a lot of military forces on both sides of the fighting, um, and similarly the, the, the luminescent indices and, uh, and hands contributed to that as well. And they have a very military look to them in terms of having those, um, those diamond-shaped sword hands, which are clearly full of luminescence, um, and uh, though today won't function in that way, back then were, would have been uh, highly, uh, highly useful for a military, um, uh, for a soldier, for example, to be able to glance at the time. These versions are very often powered by manually wound movements, um, and the war ones are always powered by, ma by manually wound movements, um, such as the P478 being one of these 15 dual movements, which was comparable to some of the Omega manually wound movements of the era, with the small seconds at 6 o'clock, and simply having the, the time on, on the, uh, the dial, because of course watches didn't have um, uh, automatically changing dates uh, at this stage. And these wartime black dial versions offer really the closest you can get for under a £1,000 to one of these, uh, these military timepieces, or Flieger timepieces in fact, used by pilots which is something really fantastic if you're, you're interested in collecting these watches, um, but, uh, but of course for a daily wear, I wouldn't necessarily recommend wearing one of these plated models, just for fear of damaging the surface, though this is a personal choice. I myself personally would be a tad concerned about wearing one. However, luckily enough, post-war, they produce slightly different watches, which are also very, very appealing. Now, post-war, these watches made a transition back towards being primarily made out of stainless steel. And this is certainly visible on the vintage market, because those pr produced post-war feature both lighter dials, as they, they no longer produce these military dials with these dark colours, but rather move towards reusing that style of hands, with those luminescent lozenges, and those Art Deco style of numerals, but now featured central second hands, courtesy of their P478 movements. But in addition to that, they also added uh, a slightly different uh, aspect to these watches, notably the new, uh, for 1946, JLC 476. And this movement marked uh, a significant change for the brand, because this movement was their first automatic movement, and it was a bumper movement, so it didn't have a, a freely rotating rotor, but rather had a piece which would bounce backwards and forwards off, off springs as a sort of a bumper. And as a result, these, uh, these watches are rather interesting and, and provide something very different. Now, these, these watches in this sort of range can extend up to the £1,500 mark in stainless steel with that automatic bumper movement, which personally I think is a wonderful piece of history to have on the wrist, and something very different to what you would normally be able to get hold of, 
as it really is revolutionary, yet remarkably affordable by comparison to other luxury goods from JLC. And as a result, these really beautiful little pieces, 33mm, provide a really wonderful idea as far as uh, collecting vintage watches, and if you know how to look for a refinished dial with the various um, uh, various examples of areas which have been touched, then these can be brilliant pieces to, to search for, because they're something completely off the beaten track, very different and unique depending on which model you're able to get hold of. Now the next two watches in this video are fundamentally fascinating in terms of their lineage and what they've produced in terms of design. And the first of these two is the Hanhart Chronograph. And these watches were made in both the 1930s, the late 1930s, and the 1940s, and were not issued by the Luftwaffe to, uh, to German pilots, but rather were bought by a lot of German pilots to be worn in the cockpit. And whilst the, the darkness of this period in terms of history is, is very evident, it is still very interesting to see horology's path during this time. And these watches became very famed as far as being, uh, being watches of choice for, for pilots, because they offered multiple different styles, and uh, came with uh, plated cases, you can see the vast majority of modern, um, uh, modern examples of these watches, um, which, which still remain from that period, um, have that, uh, that plating completely stripped off, and you can only see the base metal underneath. And this is something which uh, I think you just have to get to grips with if you own one of these. But they feature a very interesting set of design cues, which in many ways formed the basis for the military pilot's watch, which we know today. The general design features of these watches are very clear, with a knurled external bezel with, with a, a single red marker on it to act as a, a sort of a timing bezel, a rudimentary timing bezel, as well as cathedral hands which were luminescent in the day. And then a lot of dials also featured luminescent uh, numerals painted around the dial, though a lot of these have been refinished and, and that is something worth being careful of, um, because uh, some of these are, are quite clear redials or, or repaintings of the dial which I, I must say I don't particularly condone, um, but as a result, uh, this is very much something which uh, has to be chosen by the, 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 the buyer themselves. They also feature a bicompact layout of having the running seconds on the left-hand side of the dial and the chronograph uh, minutes on the right-hand side. Furthermore, these are controlled by, uh, by a, a single pusher or two pushers. The single pusher models act as a mono pusher arrangement where the, the pusher starts, stops, and resets the, the chronograph, and these were the earlier versions. Later on, however, we see a, a separate style, and these feature um, a, a separate style whereby you have two pushers where the top one starts and stops the chronograph and the bottom one resets, but if, if, uh, if depressed whilst the chronograph is running, will act as a flyback function and start the chronograph again without any interval which is extremely useful as a pilot in order to be able to, to, check, to start timing things instantaneously without the delay of having to press one pusher and then the other. And it's safe to say these watches aren't the most practical watches in the world, considering the fact that they are, um, that they are the age they are, and as a result will be quite temperamental to own. And they are manually wound chronographs, but they do often have fixed lugs as well, which means that you do, like on those, um, those military Omegas, have to buy straps which, uh, which wrap round and then are riveted, or indeed buy straps which, which run straight through, which can be a bit of an inconvenience, but I think for a collector who really wants a beautiful vintage timepiece, these are very, very interesting watches, and in fact spawned the whole concept of the modern uh, pilot's chronograph. Now, prices for these watches do vary depending upon the condition, how much of the watch is still, uh, still remaining from the original version, but generally you can expect to get one of these for between two and a half thousand and four and a half thousand pounds, which is not unreasonable, though I must admit, for anyone other than a, 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 um, a serious collector, this may not be worth the effort. However, the next watch in this, uh, this video really is due to the fact that its specifications are far more close to modern watches, and indeed this is marked by how long these watches were produced after this watch's uh, demise. Now, the next watch is a direct successor to that Hanhart, and these Dodan watches are French timepieces, which were produced specifically based upon what the, the French Air Force required. And I've produced a full video on this, um, so I'd encourage you to go and take a look at that about the Type 20 chronographs for the French Air Force. But really, it was once uh, the war was over and France invaded the Black Forest area of Germany, they took over a lot of, um, a lot of facilities, including the Hanhart factory, and so as a result reused the tooling in order to manufacture their own pilot's watches, and this, this uh, laid the foundations for the, um, the Type 21 specifications. And these are flyback stainless steel chronographs of 37mm in diameter, with a, uh, a slightly adjusted uh, style, bearing in mind their Type 21s, which meant they had a different bezel, as well as uh, various other changes to the general build of the watch, in order to be better timepieces as a whole. 
Now the price ranges of these watches are very comparable to those uh, those Hanharts, and though they don't have quite the history if you're interested in Flieger watches from uh, from the German Air Force, they do offer a great deal else if you're interested in French aviation, because these were very much at the core of French aviation throughout the 20th century, and not just in the 1950s, which is something brilliant to see, and the fact that to this day Dodin still produce a variant of this style of watch, albeit with a different movement, though still uh, adhering to those original specifications. It then also has a countdown uh, large bezel, which is an interesting touch, as well as a highly refined style um, in terms of, uh, of resembling those, um, those military watches made for the French Air Force, because this was very much a response to those, and was one of the four manufacturers officially commissioned by the French Air Force to manufacture watches for their pilots. With these watches you also have the peace of mind that they are made out of stainless steel and not a base metal, and as a result be far less likely to, um, to be damaged over the years to an extent that, uh, that will be unsightly. As a result these watches will simply be scuffed, and I suppose one could polish them very very lightly in order to, to bring back the shine, though I personally would advocate leaving them uh, well alone. But these are really beautiful watches, finished in a way which is truly military, they are designed to be, to be technical products, and will feature, if you get a, a military model, will feature all the necessary numbers on them to identify these particular individual timepieces. And as a result, these are incredibly personal and very interesting military pieces, which come in at a similar price range to the, the Hanharts, um, which is again very interesting, and the, the design cues are clearly carried over from those timepieces, and are seen in these, uh, these brilliantly made and, and wonderful looking manufactured watches, made by a, a family manufacturer that still exists to this day. And so in truth, these watches make a very interesting alternative to a second-hand or used Breguet Type 20, because these allow you to have that same aesthetic, but with a more refined style, as well as, strictly speaking, a more evolved style, as it was the, the, the following specification to those Breguets. Additionally, these watches um, are pieces which were genuinely used, and you can get a piece which was actually used um, by, by the Air Force, which is a tremendous thing to be able to get hold of for this sort of price range. And so as a result, I think these are fantastic options for someone who wants something a bit more expensive, um, but with incredible military history and, uh, and a really wonderful lineage of, of pilots' watches. These final watches I'd like to talk about are by far the most conservative watches on this list. And these range from between £2,000 to £5,000, and are of course the Rolex Oyster uh, Bubble Backs. And these are Oyster Perpetuals from the 1940s, and they were followed of course by the Semi Bubble Backs, and then by what we would now consider the style of a Rolex Oyster. But these show early designs um, towards that, that, that iconic design that Rolex took up, which I feel are, are unique on the market, and beautiful in their own way. Now these watches feature a stubby design with um, diameters between 31mm and 34mm, depending on which year you get. And these come in a variety of different dials, and especially with these you do have to be very careful with the dial refinishing, because pieces like, for example, the scientific dials are often um, uh, more sought after, and as a result uh, um, there can be a certain amount of foul play when it comes to, to putting a, a dial in a different case. So one does have to be careful in this respect. However, if you can get hold of a nice one of these, they offer you a wonderful aspect of a vintage timepiece, but with all the security of design of a Rolex. And in truth, the naming of these watches is very simple. These watches really were simply named because of their case backs, which extended highly out of the, the back of the watch to accommodate the winding rotor, which now was used to, to power these, these Oyster Perpetual movements. And of course, their design is reminiscent of a modern Rolex, certainly, with that particular style of lug, as well as the, the flat bezel, and, uh, and the mounting point for the straps, as well as the crown protruding. But interestingly, they have hoods between their lugs, which, uh, which mount onto the bracelet, and, and do resemble some of the strap variants of, um, of modern uh, Rolexes, through those, um, those semi-end links. And as a result, these watches are, are, are rather curious to own, and a lot of people have made quite convincing collections, actually, purely out of bubble backs, because there are so many varieties to find. And I wouldn't for a moment uh, argue that I was any sort of um, expert on these watches. But certainly it is worthwhile looking into them, because they're beautiful little glimpses into Rolex before they became the, the immense force they are today. And of course these watches are more simply decorated, with a, a far more simple amount of, br of, uh, of brushing, with primary uh, amounts of the, the case um, finished purely with, with polishing. And as a result, they do appear very old-fashioned and softer, and stubbier, you could say, in their design, with shorter lugs in relation to the dial size, as well as a smaller dial in relation to case size, 
which uh, which gives the watches a, a somewhat more more stout demeanour, and as a result are far more akin to modern Rolexes, albeit shrunk, than, for example, the watches of the 1950s, 60s and 70s from Rolex. And so what these provide the collector is something far more playful than a later Rolex Oyster, with far more different dials, with, uh, with painted numerals, and experimental uh, uh, jabs at trying to make more outlandish dials, and then more simple ones with indices. Of course, we know which ones ended up being being the primary um, uh, primary uh, uh, residence inside the Rolex case. But it's interesting to see where the start of this began, and uh, and, and in a watch which is significantly well known um, to to become a, a a watch which you could genuinely wear every day and still be able to have serviced. But the uh, but without the the concern of, of having a watch with a very very niche movement, which may be difficult to get hold of parts for. And Rolex can be difficult when it comes to servicing these pieces, but there's a significant number of these watches on the market, and as a result, servicing can still be, be managed, though of course the price will be more, um, more, more elevated than with, uh, with a modern equivalent, which is something to consider when buying one of these watches. Though overall, I think they offer a wonderful glimpse into Rolex of the past, and allow the buyer to really explore the market, and, uh, and, and get to grips with, uh, with buying a vintage watch of these types, and being careful of the potential dangers of that themselves. And so I'll conclude the video here, but do leave your comments down below as to what you thought of this video, and indeed what you thought of my choices, because I am curious, since in this video I was uh, keen to have a look at some older watches than I usually address, because I'm aware there is a, a significant interest in these pieces, um, and I haven't addressed them uh, all that much in previous versions of this video. So thank you very much for watching, if you did enjoy the video then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to enjoy more content here in the future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Armand the Watch Guy, out.